a love so amazing that it demands your soul and your life. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that we could gather in your house, Heavenly Father, to call upon your name, to say hallelujah, to celebrate with joy. The tomb is empty and he is risen. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that you'd give us something afresh, Lord God, that it wouldn't be the Easter routine, God, but rather, Heavenly Father, that once again our hearts would be stirred, our soul would be conscious, and our minds would be engaged to the wonderful love so amazing that it demands our soul and our life. So, Heavenly Father, we pray right now as we open up your word. Teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Happy Resurrection Day. Woo! It's been great. I, I feel like a child at Christmas. I do. It's amazing. And so this morning, uh, as we conclude, this was ending right what we would consider Holy Week. And we have had a great week here. And really, these terms, you're saying, boy, that sounds old-fashioned, Pastor Jim. But really, Holy Week means simply this. God has set apart a week for his children to remember him, to love him, to worship him, to be purposed in him, nothing else. Not our checkbooks, not the presents we got to buy, but really thinking of him, the significance of all of this, that we too will share in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then finally, theologically, there's no other way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we come together today. Let me just tell you something. We come to celebrate. We come to celebrate unashamedly. Because this is our hope. This is our future. And Holy Week was set apart for us. Monday we started with the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Where the Lamb of God was chosen and exposed. He came riding in on a donkey. We saw her on Monday came. And the cleansing of the temple. A place of prayer was established. Healing in the temple. Teaching in the temple. On Tuesday. The Lord went up on Tuesday to the Mount of Olives overlooking the Temple Mount. And there he speaks of things to come. The destruction of the Temple. Wednesday it says he gave the, fi he gave the final invitation. It says, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. And he departed and hid. He rested. And on Thursday he went up to the upper room where Peter and John had put together the Passover, and we shared the Passover and the, the um, significance of the four cups, and spe specifically the cup of redemption. And then when Jesus was done, he said, it's time to go. And they went to the garden. And on Friday, we spent much time with the anguish of the cup in which our Lord would have to drink the cup of God's wrath. Then they traveled to Calvary where our Savior was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. He became sin who knew no sin. And what we heard upon the cross still echoes today and gives us reason to celebrate today. He first said this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was forsaking sin once and for all. Forever, past sin, present sin, future sin. Through the work of Christ, the Lamb of God on the cross, he was satisfying the wrath of God. He was, God himself was forsaking sin. And we know on that day it became very dark. But the compassion of our Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Then we heard the completion of the passion of Christ. It is finished. Then there was this gap of time which we haven't really talked much where Joseph of Arimathea 
and Nicodemus, which was really called the secret disciples, that they were disciples, yet they haven't exposed themselves because they would have had great conflict with the Pharisees, especially Nicodemus, where they asked for his body and they put him in the tomb. Nicodemus purchased 75 pounds of uh, myrrh and the other spices to adorn his body. And they took the body down and they bound it in linen cloths, which was the custom of the Jews. And there was a God near Calvary and there was a new tomb, which they laid the Lord in. A stone was rolled over to cover the entrance, so no wild animals could even enter in. We also know in Matthew's account that the Pharisees and the scribes went on to say this. They went to Pilate and said, listen, we need you to put guards in front of the tomb. You know, the Lord said that he would rise on the third day. So Pilate sent guards and he put the signet, he sealed. You know, if there's anything we're sealed in, I want you to know this. Purposefully significantly and theologically you are sealed in Christ not a Roman signet and as they did that you know what happened the angels came and they acted like dead men they were so afraid but that's where we are today and I chose the Gospel of Luke, this resurrection is in every Gospel. But I chose Luke for this reason. Luke was not there. And as we read today, you're going to see something. Luke was a very intelligent, he was a physician. He was well versed in Greek and you can tell the way he writes. See, there's something I want you to know. That Christianity isn't about simple-minded fishermen. There was doctors, there was tax collectors, there were a bunch of people you'll see coming to Christ, very intelligent people. So Luke did not listen to just what anybody was saying. Luke went right to the source. He talked with Mary. He talked to Salome. He talked to them all. He got first-hand information. To the point is this, we know it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, is this. If you don't believe Luke, just ask them. They were alive. And this is the way we come into the text today. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. And I would ask today that you would stand with me for the reading of God's word. Let's stand in celebration in unity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 24, I will read the first 12 verses for you this morning. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking spices and they had, that they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by, stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other woman with them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. They did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw linen cloths by themselves, and he went home, marveling at what he had heard, had seen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. And we ask for a blessing upon the reading of your word. It is your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I got a funny title for you this morning. My funny title is this, Empty and the Victory of the Cup. Empty 
And it's kind of a peculiar title. But it reflects two things for me. First, there's never been such an event in all of history and all the world to find something empty. To find nothing. Except linen cloths. Never been such a time in history. This one empty tomb is the vindication of the cross. It is the affirmation of the Christian faith. It is the justification for the sinner. I thought, who would understand this? And I shared this with the group downstairs this morning. Someone might understand this, is if you've dealt with cancer in your life, and you've gone to and done all that the doctors have said, and you've gone through all of your treatments, You've done all, everything that they've asked you to do. Struggled with the treatments. And then finally you go to another doctor's appointment. You've had another scan and you had another doctor's appointment. And guess what? It's gone. It's gone. I can't fathom what they would feel right then. The fact that there's nothing, it means something. The fact that something gives them hope. I hope you can understand that. That there's many in this room that's probably struggling with the same thing. That would love to hear a doctor say nothing. That's who I feel like could understand what happened on that morning. And, and to see how Luke writes... I always say, look for words that repeat in the scripture. The word they is used quite frequently in this. I'll tell you, if you took your pen, and it's, not, it's okay to write in your Bible, and you underlined they, I think this would be incredible for you this Easter. They, 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 they went, they prepared, they were perplexed, they told, they, the women, the women, Mary Magdalene, all the women that was talked about, they're the ones that gave the testimony to this. And Luke writes firsthand from this. Then you look at the victory of the cup. The cup which Christ drank was full of the wrath of God and the satisfaction of Christ's death found the satisfaction from the Father. Victory over sin and death. Victory over the evil one. And we come together today to celebrate. And then celebrate in the profound statement that we find in verse 6 here. Church, if there's anything to celebrate today, it's he has risen. You might meet some people today that don't understand this. Just tell them this. He's risen. He's risen. He's risen from the dead because he's Lord. He's risen. I'm excited. He's risen. Are you excited this morning? Say it with me. He's risen. Oh, let's tell everybody. The women did. The women did. Praise the Lord. This morning we're going to look at three evidences of these encounters that they had. And then I would like to look at three points of what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? So let's begin in Luke 24. It begins this way, but on the first day of the week, I stopped right there. The reason why we're here this morning, Sunday morning, the first day of the week, was because of the resurrection. They didn't celebrate. The Christian church did not get together on the regular basis on Good Friday as much as the cross was so important. They got together on the day of the resurrection, the day of conquering, the day of victory. This is the hope of the Christian church. The tomb was empty. The resurrection of Christ. It is the reason... Why we're here. Friday was a tragic in human sense. Saturday was the Sabbath rest of the Lord. And Sunday, 
victory. And then it goes on to say this. At early dawn, they went to the tomb. I want to stop here for a minute because all four Gospels have this glorious account. All inspired by the Holy Spirit. All with perspective nuances of the Gospel writer. I love what John MacArthur, he, he commented on this particular fact. And he said this, that the Gospel accounts found in the Holy Scripture has an implicit harmony. Implicit harmony. That what's said, and it's harmonized on four truths. Here's the four truths. The empty tomb. It's empty. Everyone said, it's empty. Two, the divine angelic testimony. Three, the testimony of they, the woman. And then finally, the unbelief of the apostles. This harmonizes it in fullness. And we'll look at different gospel writings this morning. In Luke's gospel, he wasn't there. But those eyewitnesses were. And he took down every word. In John 19, 26 and 27, it says, When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother, remember this on the cross, and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son, speaking of John, and he said to the disciple, John, behold your mother. They were there. They were there, in fact, when they saw Joseph and Nicodemus come and take the body of Jesus Christ to the tomb. They knew where he was laid. They knew where to go. The text uses the word a lot in verse 10, and we get to know the women. It goes on in verse 10, it says, it was Mary Magdalene and Jonah and Mary, the mother of James and other women. Mary Magdalene, if you remember, she was the woman who Jesus cleansed from the seven demons and he became, she became a follower, a travel companion with the disciples. She followed Christ. She followed him. The next was Joanna. Interesting enough, we have one delivered and now we have Joanna and I don't know if you know much about Joanna, but her husband was the manager of Herod's affairs. In fact, so much so that her husband would have had to carry out the beheading of John the Baptist. Yet Joanna was a follower of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the influence of the gospel? We think it's only them. Oh, they're the only ones that believe this. No, this went into Herod's household. And Joanna believed. Joanna followed. And then we have Mary, the mother of James, the apostle. And then there was other ones. Salome, who was the mother of John and James, the sons of thunder. There was many women there. And the text tells us that they went on early dawn. The Sabbath was now over. And our gospel writers speak of the darkness right before the rise of the sun. Yet it was still Sunday. And in some, one gospel, John's gospel alludes to Mary Magdalene actually arriving first. And they were taking spices, the text tells us this morning, that they had prepared. Interesting enough, they're going to the tomb to find somebody dead. That's what they were expecting. See, on Friday... On Luke 23, 56, the women returned after the crucifixion. They were there and prepared spices and ointments. On Friday, the women upholding the Sabbath rested like the Lord was resting. Then these women were, went and they took spices on Sunday. They were not expecting the resurrection. But out of love and affection for their Lord, they wanted to adorn his body so his body wouldn't stink. See, their, their, their initial expectation was death. Second, it says, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Interesting enough, in Mark's gospel, in chapter 16, verse 3, they were saying to one another along the way, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They didn't even know how they were going to open it. They were expecting someone dead. They didn't know how they were going to roll away the stone. This is what I love about these women. They kept going. 
Matthew's account tells us this. So we get a little idea of what was going on. As they were walking, they're thinking these things. And yet in Matthew 28, 2, and behold, there was a great earthquake. A great earthquake. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And Matthew 28, 4 tells us, for the fear of him, we, we know that the gods trembled and became like dead men. This was all going on. They're on their way. They don't know. All they know is they have the spices and the ointment. They didn't know how they would roll away. This is a big stone. This wasn't no little, you know, okay, we'll roll it like a snowball. This was a big stone that a, an adult could actually walk into the tomb. They were carved out and hewed out of rock. And, and so they're wondering all these things. And God had already had a plan. He causes this great earthquake. And an angel comes. But it says this in verse 3. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord. In Luke's account, the woman went in and they didn't find the body. I wonder what they were thinking. I wonder what was going through their mind at this point. Well, in John's gospel, it helps us. And this is why reading all the accounts is very helpful because it gives you the fullness of these accounts. John was focused on this, that they had taken the Lord, what was going on, their, their discussion. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they had laid him. They thought the body was stolen. Now the body's not there. And a re any reasonable mind is going to say, who took the body? Who took the body? They expected someone dead. They didn't know how they were going to roll away the stone. And they're just wondering. And they were confused. Why? Well, the scriptures tell us here they were perplexed. Verse 4, while they were perplexed about this, Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. In the midst of their perplexities, what does it mean? They lacked understanding. They didn't know, like, they couldn't understand. There's nobody there. Where was the resurrection in their mind? We have all the Gospels verify the empty tomb, and here comes the angel. Every Gospel. In this one, it says, two men stood in dazzling apparel. I don't know what dazzling apparel is, but I'll tell you, the other Gospels help us. Matthew's Gospel, their appearance was like lightning, and their clothes were as white as snow. Do you ever see lightning come down from the sky? How bright it is, how powerful it is. Oh, that's dazzling. In Mark's account, he says this, they were dressed in a white robe. It had to have been illuminating. And John's account, he says the angels were in white. Can you get something? When God does something, even when you don't understand it, it doesn't mean it's not true. And, and when God moves, and when God moves the heart and God moves the mind, there's something dazzling, profound about God. And how could words even describe it? I wonder how they came up with the word dazzling. Or like lightning. I'm not sure how you would describe it if you were there. He goes on to say this, and they were frightened by all of this. And they bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? The angelic question, why do you seek him here? They were probably thinking... We were thinking about a dead person. Look at the ointment. We, we, we were seeking someone dead. The angel asks a very penetrating question that goes deeper than just our thoughts here. The angels ask that question, why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you here this morning? Why are you here? Because our Lord is risen. Hallelujah. But this is the question he's asking. Don't you remember the testimony of the Lord? Verse 6, do you remember that he's risen? 
Remember how he told you why he was still in Galilee. Don't you remember? You know something? Sometimes we walk out of here on a Sunday and we forget half of what we were already talking about. And it's so easy to forget. That's why we're coming to the Lord's table today. This is the gospel. This is the life, the death, and hallelujah, the resurrection to a greater truth of another resurrection on the last day. Jesus came for the purpose of God, just for the sinner and the lost. He'd shed his blood, an atonement, a lamb for sin. He would suffer and die, and on the third day he would rise again according to the scriptures. And this is no idle tale. This is not a myth. This isn't a bunny. This is the truth, living word of God. Inspired by God himself, the Holy Spirit. And he would ascend into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession, and he will return as a judge, the living and the dead. And if there's anything we can hold on to, beloved, is why we stood this morning together, the reading of God's word. His scripture is true. His scripture is true. So why are you here? Do you remember these things? This is what the Lord has said to us in the scriptures. Yes, he would ascend into the glory he had with his father. He'd make intercession. He'd be the high priest of our confession. He literally would go before God in intercession for us. He would keep us on this journey to God. Remember, and that's what we plan on doing as we move to the table this morning. Remember, this should change every believer's life. Are you humbled by the cross this morning? Are you pardoned by his piercing? Is your hope found in his resurrection? The angels testified to what the Lord had said. He's risen. He's risen from the dead. The tomb is empty. And there's victory in the cup. Then he goes on to say this. They told all these things. 24, 7 through 9, and 11 through 12. The Son of Man must be delivered up. This was the testimony into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day and rise. This is what they heard. And it says, after the angels make testimony to these things, and they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. They heard, they remembered, they told. I love this. They did this. And it could be helpful for us this morning. And it says that even in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 28, 9, when they were on the way back, they saw Jesus. And it says they had great fear and great joy. But they grabbed him by the feet and they worshipped him. What a response. Imagine the emotions going on being afraid and joyful at the same time. It's like walking into that doctor's office. Knowing that you went through the treatments. Knowing you had the diet that they told you to do. Knowing that you've done everything you possibly could. And you're walking into that doctor thinking in the back of your mind. And you are fearful. And yet what's in front of you, you walk in. Knowing you've done everything with joy. What a picture. And it says to them, they told them everything. Can you imagine this? We ran to the tomb. We didn't know what we were going to do, how to move the stone. But you won't believe it. An earthquake came. And then... you. Even more than this, it was an angel like lightning came from heaven. And he came down and the angel, they moved the stone. Holy mackerel. And it was dazzling. And they told us, don't be afraid. We were scared. We were perplexed. 
And he said he wasn't here, that he had risen. The apostles must have been looking at him saying, that's a bit dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> See, this is no idle tale, though. This is literally what they saw. And they were expressing every emotion, everything that they saw, everything that they heard, every part of their senses was engaged in the resurrection and they were explaining it to the apostles. And then we finally see the, the unbelief of the apostles. It says in 11, verse 11, but these words seem to be like an idle tale. They did not believe them. Beloved, I want to say this to you. There's a big difference between what the woman saw and what the apostles heard. And I say this in this way. You can go to church every Sunday of your life and not believe what you hear. You can hear it time and time again, the gospel, that Jesus Christ had to die for the sin of the world and yet live like none of it makes any sense or it has no meaning to your life. The, the apostles walked with Jesus. They heard all his teaching. They saw literally the lame walk, the leper cleansed. They saw the blind see. But they didn't believe the woman. I don't know how that sits with you. You know what it did for me? I need to start living and walking and moving within the words of scripture in my life, that there'd be no fiber in me that would doubt the truths of scripture. You know, some people have written, some liberal commentators have written that, oh, well, the reason why they didn't believe because a woman's testimony wasn't admissible. Can I tell you, I think that's baloney. If we think that unbelief is rooted in gender, you're wrong. Mary Magdalene believed. Joanna believed. See, unbelief is rooted in something else. Maybe it was rooted for them in pride. Why didn't he come to us first? I'm the beloved one, John. Wait a minute, I'm the rock, Peter. Why didn't they come? Why didn't Jesus come to us first? Because they didn't go to the tomb first. Unbelief's a powerful thing, you know. Unbelief is formed out of a place of maybe even religious expectation. You want God a certain way. You want Jesus a certain way. And Jesus isn't that way. So you start unbelieving. Maybe it's in the expectation of you need something right now for Jesus to do in your life. And you've been praying and you've been crying out and you think, man, this guy just does not hear me. Maybe Jesus is deaf. Unbelief is rooted in many things. But it's not in gender. But we see... In verse 12, that the testimony hit the curiosity of Peter. Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home, marveling at what had happened. You know what's interesting? And I'm probably going to kill this word in the Greek, but this word marveling, it struck me. Like, what was he feeling? What was Peter experiencing now? We already understood what the women were thinking and how they were feeling. But now we got Peter that goes to the tomb. And this word marveling, I think it's pronounced thoma or thuma. And what it means is to have a thought here. He has no explanation for what he's seeing. He just doesn't have an explanation for it. There's nothing reasonable. You know why it's not reasonable? Because it's theological. This was supposed to happen. And God said it was going to happen. See, Peter went in and he saw nothing. The tomb was empty. The linens were there. 
Peter was contemplating the truth of the resurrection, but he could not understand it. Marveling. How about you? We come to church today, and I struggle with this. When I, when I, in text, that's so familiar. What else can I say? I chose Luke because he did it through the eyes of other people. And, and the reason why I took that is because they were left with something. They were left feeling something. They were left with an experience that no one else had. Peter was left with these feelings. And, and I wanted us to have these feelings. What does it mean when it says he's risen? What does it mean for you? I have three things for you. And I hope this is encourages you in your faith. Here's the first one. Death is defeated. And I don't know if it excites you. It excites me. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. It says, for by as one man came, death came. By a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. The last enemy in verse 26 will be destroyed. Death. Oh, 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 55. Death is swallowed up in victory. The cup of victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The resurrection of Jesus Christ's death is only a door and a means to eternal life for those who believe in him. Death's been defeated. If you want anything in your 401k today, take that statement in the Bible and send it to who's doing your investing. Death's been defeated. You can't quantify it. You can marvel at it. But it's been defeated. He conquered death. He conquered the evil one. It's amazing. What a truth. This is for us. Death has been defeated. Yes, one day we will close our eyes and we will take our last breath. But God will open our eyes and we will be with him as the scriptures say. And that's something to hold on to. Death is defeated. Praise the Lord. That's what it means. He is risen. That death is defeated. Here's the second thing. The whole person will be redeemed. Oh, here's another great mystery. The good news that Jesus has risen is that we share in his resurrection. The whole person will be redeemed. Wait a minute. What are you saying, Pastor Jim? My body goes to the ground when I take that last. Yes, your soul, you go right to the present Lord, absent of the mind, present with the Lord. But there will be a day. There's going to be a glorious day, a day of a last resurrection when the Lord returns and he is going to bring you up and raise you to glory. He is going to give you your glorious body for the glorious kingdom, for the purpose of everlasting joy with the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is what it means that he's risen. Your whole body will be redeemed. Your whole body, a glorious body, will be redeemed. 2 Timothy 4.8 says this. Henceforth, there is laid up for me, this is the Apostle Paul writing, a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. This is what it means. Tomb's empty. And the consummation of all things will raise you up on that last day. The crown jewel of our faith, a glorified body. He's going to unite the soul and body that we are going to have perfect what he designed into the image of his son for the eternal kingdom. And you will walk in everlasting joy in the kingdom that has no boundaries, not made by man, but made by God himself. He's risen. Death has been defeated. The whole body will be resurrected. And then finally this, risen means for us, we all will be changed. And you're saying, wow, in what way will we be changed? We can always go to the Bible and find that out. Great text in the light of the resurrection, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. 
1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44, he leaves us with four aspects of this change. Listen to what he writes. In verse 42, so it is written, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable will be raised imperishable. Scripture says the outer body is being wasting away. I am wasting away today. But yet there is a glorious, what's perishable in this life will be raised imperishable. Imperishable means the glorified body will never decline. Imagine that. Never age. Woohoo. Never sick. Never in pain. Can you just write never in your Bible? Like, this is what it means that he's risen. Never. We're going to get a body where there's no more sorrow, no more pain. Heart, mind, soul, strength. Imperishable. And then he goes on to say this in verse 43. What is sown in dishonor, the reality of now, is raised in glory. You're going to be raised in glory. And what this means, that God himself will restore the image of his son, the brightness of Christ. The dishonor was Adam's race. Now... The first fruit of heaven is going to return, and he's going to be glorious. I can't even think of it. Like, this excites me so much. Like, all the, I'm not carrying, I want you to understand this. We're not going to carry any shame. We're not going to carry anything that would diminish the glory of God. He is going to do a work. That all those things in the past, we're going to live in the illumined light with the saints in the restoration of Christ in us. Then he goes, that's the second one. Then he goes this. In what's sown in weakness is going to be raised in power. Raised in power. Beloved, what you are going to experience is this. Because he's risen. You are going to see the death will hear. You are going to see that um, not only the deaf will hear, the blind will see, the lame will walk, our minds will be corrected. No more anxiety. No more depression. This is what it means that he's risen for us, that he'll be raised in the power of God. Once the flesh, we know the flesh is weak. It sows in death but raised in power. Beloved, this is what it looks like. Energy, endurance, vitality. This is your glorified body. This is what it means to us when we say, He has risen. Well, I don't know about you. I could use that. And then in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 44, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And if there is a natural body, which we know there is, we can all look at each other. He says there's a spiritual body. It doesn't mean that you're an orb. It means that you are going to be standing on the solid rock. You are going to be standing in the new Jerusalem. You're going to stand in a city. And you're going to look at it. And you're going to be amazed. Maybe even overwhelmed by the beauty of what God could build. And you're going to walk those streets. You're going to walk those paths. You're going to walk these fields. And you know what God is going to say? Keep walking. Enjoy this kingdom. It has no end. It's boundless. What joy that we could have with this spiritual body. See, 1 Thessalonians 4 promises that the trumpet's going to sound. And the voice of the archangel shouting. And the dead being raised and gathered with him who have died in Christ and coming into the presence of the eternal kingdom together. You know what I thought it was like? God brought me this memory. I remember at Christmas time with our kids, it's the only day that they wouldn't sleep in. You're exhausted, you're putting things all together, you probably lived this. Right? And, and so what you did, though, is you kind of had this instruction. We're not going into the living room under the tree until we all wake up. So what we do is hey, they would take care of it. You know, they're all the way up. Well, they're like, Dad, you got to get up. And I'm like, I'm exhausted. I don't want to stay in bed. 
But you got to understand something. I want to see. I want you to see a picture. The kids are waiting. They're right by the door to go into the living room. How do they go in? They run in. Can I tell you what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is saying? We are going to run in together. Each one. We're going to run in together like little children. We're going to run in to see the glory of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to run in to the glory of heaven. We're going to run to see and to experience that this tomb being empty means everything in the world. Christ died for your benefit, but your benefit is for the future. What a picture. And let me just tell you something. This is no idle tale. This is no time to unbelieve. Because none of us know when that day will happen. When those trumpets sound. But when they do, will you sit in unbelief? As it seems like an idle tale? Or will you stand and just welcome your king? I just want to end here. I was thinking, you know, I like the hymns. I was thinking about what it must have been in the heart of this hymnist who wrote this. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know, and I know you know, he holds the future. A life is worth living just because he lives. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, that the tomb is empty and there's victory in the cup. We know that Christ satisfied the wrath of God. He was the propitiation for our sin. He satisfied God. And he was raised from the dead, conquering death, the first fruit of heaven. That he came to live. He came to ascend. He came to do all of what the Father had decreed. And he said upon the cross of Calvary, and it echoes today, it is finished. And Heavenly Father, in the way that the apostles experienced him leaving, and the angels stood by, what encouraging words, he will return. So Heavenly Father, we pray right now. We pray and we just want to ask, Heavenly Father, that you'd prepare us right now, Heavenly Father, as we think about this table to remember here. Lord, I pray that you'd pour onto us the oil of salvation. If there's someone struggling in their faith or maybe don't understand, maybe perplexed here this morning, we pray for the oil of salvation. Heavenly Father, ready our hearts and our minds for this. Help us, Heavenly Father, God, in our own perplexities, saying that we don't know all things, and we know that. Yet we desire to seek the things we seek not. We hope for the things our senses are dull. Let that be our prayer this morning, Heavenly Father, that you would help us and guide us into all truth. Just like what the woman heard, don't you remember? So that's what we come to do today. And unashamedly about all these things, unashamedly we say this, he is risen, the tomb is empty, and there is victory in the cup. So, Heavenly Father, we say thank you for that, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as we prepare for the cup, I, I want to go to Luke's sequel. And